Welcome everyone in this session that's called Zero to Hero in Kubernetes Java. So um, what is Kubernetes Java exactly? Or what is Kubernetes native? And what's the difference between Kubernetes native and cloud native? Is it the same? Kind of, not really, but kind of. So cloud native basically is a superset of Kubernetes native because it can be uh, an application that you deploy, it could be to Kubernetes, but it could be maybe you're deploying a serverless function uh, into the cloud or your container to the cloud, and you're not using Kubernetes. So that's kind of you know the difference between cloud native. So cloud native, you know, can be AWS uh, or Google Cloud or Azure or IBM Cloud, whatever. Alibaba is on that slide here too. Uh, whereas of course Kubernetes native is always on Kubernetes, which could still be on one of those cloud providers or on a Kubernetes on-prem or something, but you know, just to clarify what uh, Kubernetes native is. Um, and so we're going to be talking about Kubernetes native Java. And there's one particular stack that does that really well, and that's, uh, and that's Quarkus. So if you haven't heard of, uh, of Quarkus yet, it's a Java stack uh, that's kind of uh, built from the ground up to be uh, really well integrated uh, for Kubernetes applications because Whereas a traditional Java application kind of starts up a little slow, it's built for you know kind of more dynamic behavior, you know, classic application servers where you don't constantly start up these applications, right? You just uh, you know do some dynamic loading and everything. But if you want to run Java in a container, those containers can uh, you know you want to scale fast, so new containers start up. Uh, maybe containers get moved from one server, one node to another, and they need to start up fast, right? Because you know, like if you scale multiple containers and they don't start up as fast, well, then your scaling isn't going to be so great when you get a bunch of requests, right? So Quarkus starts up way faster because it moves all that kind of build stuff, uh, the optimization that the JVM and the classic Java applications do during startup time. It does that during build time, and then it you know does some uh, elimination of things that it notices that you don't need, and so it packages it down way smaller too. So that's also an advantage in the in the cloud native and the Kubernetes world. So that's why Quarkus is going to be the stack that uh, that we're going to be using today. Um, it also has a really cool developer experience, and uh, I'll show that in a, uh, I'll show that too. Um, and that's pretty much it for my slides. Uh, so, you know, are you ready to be a hero? And uh, we're going to start from completely from scratch. We're going to build an application, you know, add some REST endpoints, and then we're going to deploy it, of course, to Kubernetes. We're going to see how we can actually leverage things in Kubernetes like config maps and secrets uh, to deploy, um, you know, kind of a production-ready-ish application. And hopefully I can do that in less than half an hour. So wish me luck. <laughs> All right. So... To get started, we need, uh, we need to get started with uh, Quarkus, right? So one way you can do that is you can go to Quarkus.io, and then you land on this uh, pretty cool page, and you know shows right there, supersonic, subatomic Java. So supersonic because it's really fast, subatomic because it's uh, very small, and uh, well, of course, it's Java, right? So we can use our Java skills that we all love and you know use the entire ecosystem but you know, have all the advantages of fast startup time and, and use uh, and small footprints and everything that other stacks also uh, have outside of Java, but now we can use with Java. Anyway, so if you want to get started, one way to do that is uh, you, know, you go here to start coding. And then uh, you know, if you're familiar with maybe the Spring Starter, it's kind of similar, right? So you have uh, um, a way to get started with the applications. You can choose which dependencies you want to use. There's a whole bunch of them. And then you can generate your application, download it as a zip, or push it to your GitHub, and you're up and running. Um, you can also use uh, plugins in your IntelliJ or VS Code and get started like that. Or there's a Quarkus CLI too, and that's kind of handy. And that's what I'm going to use because you know that looks way cooler, right? You know, CLI terminal. So uh, I'm going to create my application, Quarkus, create app, and then uh, some name. Let's call it Cube native. And just by doing that, Quarkus create app. Uh, I could have specified certain extensions, dependencies that I was going to use. But just if you do this, 
uh, Quarkus will create an application, so you can see, you know, like there's Java and it uses Maven by default. I could have also specified Gradle. Uh, it generates, you know, of course, some uh, Quarkus libraries and uh, even some Docker files, so I can get, you know, build a container pretty easily from scratch here as well. Um, and then it adds this uh, rest easy reactive code start because I didn't specify any specific things. So it's like here, Kevin, here's some, uh, some stuff to get you started with your cloud native application or your Kubernetes native application in this case. So let's go and take a look at it. So um, I'm gonna use uh, VS Code in my case, but you know, I could have used IntelliJ too. Um, and so we have here our application and you know, this should be pretty familiar if you're a Java developer. Uh, you know, you have your regular pom.xml, we have the Quarkus uh, bomb here, we have the Java 17 that we're using, um, and some dependencies that it added, like Quarkus Arc for dependency injection, so we get some stuff kind of uh, for free out of the box. And then uh, we have even a little uh, greeting resource, so we have a little endpoint to get started with, and it says, you know, hello from uh, rest easy reactive, that's kind of the default here. Now, Quarkus has this uh, dev mode, which is pretty handy. So if I open this, uh, I'm gonna run this in my terminal here, and I'm gonna do Quarkus dev. So you know, using that uh, Quarkus CLI again, you could also do Maven Quarkus dev, but why would I type Maven if I can just quark type Quarkus dev? Anyway, I'm gonna start that up. And so that's gonna start up the application on my local machine. And then uh, in a few seconds, I can go and look and see if my uh, hello endpoint has started. So I'm gonna hit W and that opens it up right in my browser. So woo, congratulations, I already have <laughs> a Quarkus application up and running. So it you know, adds this little uh, HTML page too, which is, which is handy, but here's my hello endpoint. And well, shocker, hello from REST Easy Reactive, right? N nothing too uh, spectacular just yet. Um, but so what's, what's cool with the Quarkus dev mode is that, you know, now if I change this, uh, let's say, hello from Berlin, um, I'm not recompiling anything and I just go back to, uh, to my browser, I hit refresh and my change is there, right? So I don't need to do anything. So I get a quick feedback loop, I can work pretty quickly, but I was kind of a bad developer just now because I'm making the code changes without making the test changes, right? Because actually, uh, Quarkus in my code starter also provided me with uh, some tests as well, and they're looking for hello from REST Easy Reactive. And, you know, I don't know if you're, you're probably a better developer than I am, but, you know, like, oftentimes what happens is I'll make my code changes and I'll do my Maven package or something, and then, uh, then I'll realize like, oh, these tests are broken because I forgot that there's actually tests that are covering my code. Um, which is actually what's the case, right? So Quarkus has this continuous testing mode. So if I hit R, you can see here, R to resume, then uh, I start this continuous testing mode. And, you know, sure enough, it notices that my test failed because I changed the expectation. Uh, we can see that, well, this is, I'm gonna make it a little bit smaller so I can actually see what I'm doing. Uh, test failed, and then uh, here we go. Expected is, hello from REST Easy Reactive. So I should have changed first my tests probably, <laughs> and then uh, Berlin. And now, you know, by just changing my code, uh, Quarkus automatically notices, hey, you made a change here, so I'm gonna reload just this particular test. Or, you know, if I change the, the class itself, it's gonna uh, know which tests are related to that and just rerun those. So I get a really quick feedback loop of, uh, of uh, what's, what's going on with my application and I don't need to uh, have that, you know, kind of unexpected at the end stuff. Anyway, so of course we're talking about Kubernetes native. This is kind of pretty basic, right? It's hard coded string. So let's make this a little more interesting and uh, let's make this a little bit more dynamic. So we'll do, uh, we're gonna return a greeting from a configuration property. So we can add a config property and Quarkus tries to use uh, standards like uh, Jakarta EE, like microprofile standards. So in this case, you can see we can just use a microprofile config property, uh, add a name, we'll call it uh, greeting, and then uh, string greeting. And so, you know, so now we have a dynamic 
uh, value for our string. Now, of course, I haven't defined it yet, but I'm going to be kind of silly and test it anyway. Oops. Let's uh, stay up there. There we go. Hit refresh. And of course, Quark, it says, well, this is not right. You forgot something. But what's kind of cool is that it did notice that there's a configuration property missing. Why don't you just uh, fill it right in here? So, uh, you know, <laughs> I'll help you out a little bit, Kevin, because you're being kind of uh, silly. So we can change this greeting again to, you know, hello, developers, whatever, right? Update. And by doing that, you know, of course, our, uh, my, my, uh, my application is, is working again. But you can see now if we go to our uh, application properties, mouse, please work with me. Uh, resources, there we go. Application properties. Quark has added that from the UI, so that's kind of handy. So of course, now I again broke my test, so I should probably fix that. Hello, developers. I should have done that first, probably. Developers, OK. And so our tests are passing, good to go. I have you know, a little more interesting application um, running. But it's not cube native, because you wouldn't hard code those properties necessarily in your application properties. In Kubernetes, you would use config maps, right? And so that's something that you can work with uh, with Quarkus pretty easily. But before we do that, of course, I need a Kubernetes cluster. So um, in my case, I'm going to use a, uh, an OpenShift sandbox. If anybody was in one of the previous sessions, you probably already saw it. So if you go to developers.redhat.com, you can get this uh, free, star free uh, developer sandbox to play around with. If you have your own Kubernetes cluster, uh, you, know, you can use that as well. Um, it, you know, right now we don't have any resources here, and uh, I'll just log in to my cluster, my CLI. So I just uh, go to login, get a token, and uh, copy that. Go back to my VS Code. I'll open a new terminal and log in to my cluster. Maybe if I pasted it right. If not. It'll be OC login or kubectl login. But actually, I cheated because I'm already logged in. So let's pretend that that happened. <laughs> All right. So now that uh, we have an, uh, a cluster to deploy to, well, let's add a little bit of capability to Quarkus to actually work with, uh, with Kubernetes. So you can do with the Quarkus CLI, you can do Quarkus extension add, and then you add capabilities such as you know, Kubernetes. And so uh, by doing that, um, but if we go to my target here, you can see that it'll add a Kubernetes folder. You, can, you saw it pop up, right? And it has you know, some Kubernetes YAMLs, some service and deployment, so I don't need to worry about you know, like how to write those YAMLs or anything. And I could just apply that, and, uh, and that would push my configuration to Kubernetes. Um, but I'd have to build a container and push it to a registry probably before doing that. So I'm going to cheat a little bit, and uh, instead of doing that, I'm going to add a couple more extensions, uh, one being the OpenShift extension. So I can uh, push my code to OpenShift and let OpenShift build my application. And uh, for my configuration, there's a, a Kubernetes uh, config uh, extension. That's going to help me work with config maps and eventually also secrets when I when I'll need those. So I added those extensions. And so uh, in my pom.xml, it added some more dependencies by doing that Quarkus extension add. So we can see here, there's a Quarkus Kubernetes config and whatever more. And so uh, now we can start uh, building that for my application. So I'm going to go back to my application properties and add a few things to uh, wire everything up. So for, um, for deploying to OpenShift, I would just uh, need to do um, actually to expose my ports and my URL so we can actually test it. Because otherwise, if I just push a service, it's available. It's working on Kubernetes, but I couldn't access it from outside of the cluster. So I, if I do something like route expose, which is an OpenShift thing to expose your in, uh, ingress, and then um, uh, let's see. I want to do edge termination. Let's see if, it's, uh, if it'll work with the suggestion. 
No more suggestions, that's nice. Uh, well, actually, I don't necessarily need that. So we'll do Quarkus. And it'd be nice if, uh, if my suggestions would work, but if not, uh, I'll have to just remember. So to add the com uh, configuration maps, I need to add Quarkus dot uh, Kubernetes config dot config maps, and then uh, give it some name that I'm going to create in my cluster where I'm going to store my configuration. So it can be like my config. And then I just need to enable that uh, with Quarkus Kubernetes config. Um, enabled, I think. Let's see. Shift route, expose. I'm going to remove that one. And uh, config enabled equals true. We'll see how that goes. The, the IDE is not working with me right now, so we'll see. Anyway, so now we build our application. So I could do Maven package, um, or I can use the Quarkus CLI again. So Quarkus build. And then I'm going to add one uh, special property, which is uh, Quarkus.openshift. Open. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Nobody saw that. <laughs> Quarkus openshift deploy equals true. And so by doing that, I'm building my application, and I'm going to deploy it to, uh, to OpenShift. And hopefully, if everything goes well, it's going to uh, push my code and start deploying onto my OpenShift cluster. So we'll see if that, uh, if that works. All right, so we see that uh, our tests are running. And that could actually be a problem, uh, because I enabled the config, the config map um, uh, property. Uh, key Quarkus Kubernetes config config map was provided, but it doesn't recognize it. Okay, so it is not entirely correct. So I'm gonna try one more time and see if it, ah, I get my suggestions back. That's uh, a lot easier. So Quarkus Kubernetes config uh, config maps equals my config. And so there was some typo in my previous command, okay. So let's try that again. In the meantime, everything is deploying, but my config map wouldn't be used yet. But that's, uh, that's fine. We'll try it again. Because in the meantime, I need to create that config map still on my cluster. So let's add it real quick. So in OpenShift, you can use the UI, which is kind of handy. So I call it my config. I hope this is big enough for you in the back. Um, if not, let's try to make it a little bit bigger. Doesn't want to. There we go. And uh, I had the key greeting, right? That was my configuration property. And uh, let's call it hello from my config map, just to make sure that we know that it's actually coming from the config map. And so we'll create that. And uh, if we go back to our deployment, well, this time the test failed because I have this uh, configuration property set to use config maps. And so even on my local machine, because I'm logged into the Kubernetes context, it's trying to use the config map value. And so my test is expecting hello developers, right? So what I could do is for my local testing, I want to use my local values. So I just add prod uh, to, my, uh, to my configuration property. And by doing that, uh, these values are going to be ignored unless I'm running in a production environment, well, in a production environment. Whereas on my local machine, I'm running in a dev mode, so my, my profile is dev, it's not prod. So that's how we're going to be able to do our tests properly and then deploy to Kubernetes. So we'll give that a little bit of time. We'll see that you know, the tests should work this time. Uh, and um, while I'm doing that, I'm going to show you another cool thing. Oh, wrong browser. Uh, which is the dev mode in, uh, in Quarkus. So if you go to your local host, 8080 slash Q slash dev UI. Um, you end up in this uh, Quarkus dev UI, which is uh, something that runs if you run that uh, in, the, in that dev mode. And it's kind of handy because, you know, you, based on the extensions that you add to your project, you can see, for example, that I can uh, generate my Kubernetes manifests here. I could even deploy to OpenShift from this UI. Um, I can build a container and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I can also access my, my tests from, uh, from right here so I can enable the continuous testing. And then, you know, well, good thing my test is passing. And then we'll see in a little bit when we add developer services, dev services, 
uh, some more cool stuff in there. So let's see if our build was successful. Yes. So if we go to our OpenShift, uh, to our Kubernetes cluster, we can see here that you know there's a, an application, our Kube native application, that was deployed and running. So let's see if we open it. Uh, well, congratulations, it's running in the hello endpoint. Hello from my config map. So hey, that's pretty cool. So very quickly, I was able to you know create an application with a REST endpoint and integrate it with config maps, deploy it to Kubernetes. So you know we're still in time, right? For uh, for adding some more cool stuff to uh, to our application. So right now I have a very simple kind of uh, you know yes it's a property it's not hard coded but it's still a pretty simple application. So let's uh, be a little bit more realistic. You know probably an application will use a dependency like a database or something. So let's add uh, let's add a database. So I'm going to add a few more extensions and this time I'll use the Quarkus. Uh, plugin in uh, in VS Code, and it says add extensions to current project. And if you do that, it's a little easier because you can you know you can scroll through the extensions or you can start typing. And so uh, you know I'll start typing Postgres. And so I want to add the reactive Postgres client. Um, and then uh, let's see. Then I need uh, I want to use Hibernate ORM. Um, and I want to use Hibernate Reactive with Panache, and I'll show you what, uh, what that Panache does. Um, and I think that's it. So let's add those two extensions. And so by adding a database extension, Quarkus is going to reload. Um, and so this is a little bit small here, um, but you can see here um, that, it's, uh, that it's reloading my application. And because I added a Postgres dependency, it notices that, well, you're actually not running a Postgres database on your local machine. You don't have anything configured in your application to use that. So why don't I just uh, start up uh, a, uh, a container with Postgres using test containers for you to use for your local development so you don't have to figure everything out and uh, you can get up and running pretty quickly. So uh, we can go to Podman Desktop here in this case, so Docker Desktop, our Podman Desktop, and we can see here that a, a container has started 38 seconds ago with uh, a Postgres database. So, you know, it just did that for me automatically. And so now if we add, let's say, a new entity, let's uh, call it person.java, and uh, I'm going to yeah, add an entity. And there we go. Again, using Jakarta EE core. Um, so very standard dependencies with, with Quarkus. I'm going to extend with panache entity, and that's going to give me some uh, some handy stuff to create my entity very easily. So I can just do public uh, string, let's call it a name, and uh, public string uh, location. And you're probably thinking like, well, shouldn't this be private? And shouldn't you be creating getters and setters and all that stuff? No. <laughs> with panache entity, that kind of... Uh, gets handled in the, in the background. So when it uh, compiles my application, it'll create the private uh, properties, we'll create the getters and setters, and uh, some, uh, some more kind of uh, handy features like um, you know, uh, get by ID or find all or list all and stuff like that. So uh, let's, let's do that. Let's add another method to our resource here um, to get our people from, from the database. So in this case, let's uh, add a path. So path, again, using Jakarta. Uh, and the path, let's do people. And then uh, we want to create uh, get people. I want to return it in uh, JSON format in this time. So we'll do application uh, JSON. And then I'm going to return the person dot list all. And so I get that out of, you know, out of the box with, uh, with Panache entity. And so of course, I'm not returning a string, so I need to replace that uh, with uh, uni because I'm using the reactive uh, uh, hibernate. And then uh, lists of person. OK, so uh, I need to import list Java util. Yep. All right, so now I have a method that's going to return people from my database. Now, I don't have anything in my database yet because I don't have any import statements. So let's add one real quick. So uh, create a new file. 
import.sql and uh, insert into a uh, person, right? Uh, ID, name, value, and uh, values. And then uh, we'll create a few values in our database. So let's do one Kevin from, uh, from Brussels. And then uh, two, we got uh, Natale, who was nice enough to introduce me here. He's from uh, Milano. Oops, my cursor jumped. And uh, we got uh, my colleague Alex from Barcelona. And we got, sorry, I can't type faster. Uh, and we got uh, Hans Peter from Graz in uh, Austria. Okay, so now we have some values. And so let's see if this works. I'm hoping it'll work. Hopefully I didn't forget something. So let's go back to our uh, live mode, which is still running. So we got uh, hello slash people, right? So let's try that. And we got an empty uh, result. <laughs> the good thing is that it is working. We got some, uh, it, it does recognize that there's Jason, but somewhere uh, I didn't, Maybe I uh, inserted something incorrectly. Let's go look at the logs here real quick. Uh, ba -ba -ba. If not, sorry? Location was not, oh, you're right. Thank you. Peer programming for the win. OK, so now if we go back, refresh. Oh, ooh. I remember I forgot one extension, which is the JSON B extension, of course, because we're using we're returning JSON. So add one more extension, JSON B. Uh, let's make sure it's the right one. REST easy reactive JSON B. Add that. And again, I don't need to recompile anything, so that's pretty handy, right? So uh, let's go and look, and hopefully it'll work this time. Nah, it doesn't work. Let's uh, refresh a couple times. Okay, let's uh, do this. I'm going to stop this real quick and restart it just to make sure that everything loaded correctly. And then uh, we're crossing our fingers. Everybody crossing their fingers with me? So let's see. It starts up. We can see that you know database is starting up. So dev services with Postgres starting up, blah, blah, blah. And so uh, let's hit refresh one more time. And yes, our results are there. So uh, we can see Kevin and Natalia and Alex and uh, <laughs> every, everybody's there. So now, of course, this is a cube native session, right? So this is working on my local machine. We need, uh, we need to deploy this onto uh, Kubernetes. So I'm going to add a database, of course, because we need a Postgres database. Uh, so let's see, Postgres, instantiate template, and then uh, we need a username, blah, blah, blah. Doesn't matter. Password, blah, blah, blah. I don't even need to remember it because I'm just going to use the secret later on. And then the, I think the database name was Quarkus, so we'll just do that and create a Postgres database. So by doing that, uh, in my secrets here, um, the Postgres uh, uh, Helm chart created a Postgres secret with the values, right? With the username and, and the password. And so you can see here, it's called database-password and database-user. So I'm going to be using that to configure my secret. So one nice thing with the dev UI again is that if I hit refresh here real quick and I go to my dev services, you can see now it says, hey, you have a Postgres database working in your, uh, in your dev services. And I've configured some stuff for you. So I configured that your data source was Postgres. And I created the default password and username and even a, and a URL. So I'm going to copy that and use that for my you know, production-like environment. So I need to go back to my uh, application properties and add those to my properties. There we go. But of course, my username and password, I'm going to make this a little bit smaller, aren't uh, hard-coded, right? Because they weren't Quarkus, I just uh, put in some random values because I want to use the secrets uh, in a kube-native way. So of course, Let's make sure that we're using that only on the production environment, because otherwise on my local machine, things won't work anymore because I don't have a database configured like that. So adding those values real quick. And uh, password is going to be a dynamic value. So it was, uh, I believe, database password. 
and correct me if anybody remembers if it's if it's wrong. Uh, and then uh, I think the database was database user. And then I just need to, of course, it's not going to be a local host database. It's going to be the name of the service on uh, Kubernetes. So it's going to be PostgreSQL as the name of the service. And let's go take a look at it real quick. So we can see here, hopefully my uh, database is running. Yes, I see that there's a nice blue circle, which means that it's running. And uh, sorry for those in the back, this is probably a little small, but I can see here the name of my service and the port. And so I need to copy that and add that to my configuration here. I could have added this to some config map too, but you know, let's, uh, let's not make it too complicated. So I need to add two more things here. Uh, my import script, of course. So uh, let's see, uh, script, SQL load script, which is import.sql. Uh, and then um, I need to make sure that my database gets created. So again, I can cheat, and it's not Chrome, it's uh, Firefox. I can cheat with my dev UI because it also created this uh, gen database generation for drop and create. Now, I don't, probably don't want to do a drop and create on production. Um, but I do want to do a create in case it doesn't exist yet. So uh, let's do that. And I think if I remember correctly, that should be all we need to redeploy our application. And in this case, use the database to uh, you know, be all wired in using the secrets uh, and using the database connection um, all kind of automatically without me having to create a bunch of configurations and, uh, and settings. So, uh, blah, blah, blah. Let's go here. I think it was in this uh, terminal. If not, I can just do Quarkus build. And again, we'll do the Quarkus OpenShift uh, deploy to uh, make the build happen on OpenShift. Otherwise, um, afterwards, in the booth, uh, in the Red Hat booth, I can show you how to create a container image and then push it to a registry and then use uh, the Kubernetes YAMLs, apply those. And that's how you can deploy too. In my case, because I have this OpenShift, which is nice enough to build everything for me in the cluster, it's just a little bit faster here in my, in my session. So I'm, uh, I'm using that. And it's actually a great way. But uh, you know, if you want to see the other way, um, you know, come find me and I can, uh, I can show you as well. I don't know why I keep going back to this slide when I need to go to Firefox. Uh, but so we can see for my application here that the build is running. And yeah, this is kind of small, but you can see it here. And we can look at the logs that uh, it's using these uh, images by default. So it's, uh, you know, because it's uh, OpenShift, of course, it's going to use uh, Red Hat uh, containers. But these are, you know, tested, verified, and supported by Red Hat, which is pretty cool. Uh, has OpenJDK and Maven in it to do the build. And then it'll create the container image and then uh, do the deploy. So let's see if, uh, if everything happened correctly. Um, so we can see here, the blue circle is for our previous container that uh, didn't have the database connection. And our container is creating with uh, the connection to the database. And we can see now that it's running. So if everything went well, then we can go back to our application, slash, uh, hello, slash, people. And we get an error. <laughs> so let's go see what the error is. I can go look at the logs here. Um, and it says that uh, password authentication failed. Okay, so I didn't <laughs> create my uh, secret correctly. So let's take a look at the name of the secret, which is PostgreSQL, and then database dash password and database dash user. So let's take a look and see if uh, I did that right. Actually, I know what it is. I need to enable, I need to tell Quarkus to use the secrets. So I need to add a prod, um, Quarkus, Kubernetes, config, uh, secrets to you know, give a name to my secret. Well, the name of the secret that we have, which is a PostgreSQL. And then um, prod, Quarkus, dot Kubernetes config, uh, secrets enabled. And by doing that, that's how you tell Quarkus to use the secrets and then to look for the secrets that match with, uh, with this value. And so we'll redeploy one more time. And that's uh, hopefully it'll make it work. In the meantime, I'll show you 
how this uh, Kubernetes YAML also keeps getting updated with you know, the ex extra properties that I added. So in this case, it added a service account, which is something that you need in, uh, in Kubernetes to add, you know, to create access to somebody to, or to something. It added a role binding to view secrets and to get access to these secrets. So it you know, adds all this complicated YAML that I, I could never just uh, you know, kind of come up with uh, in my head. I'd have to like cheat and, uh, and find ways, but uh, Quarkus creates all this kind of stuff for you. So it's really kind of cube native Java development. Um, and so you know, let's give it a, just a moment to deploy. And in the meantime, you know, because we have, I think, a few more minutes, um, we'll add two more things to our application. So when I deploy my application right now, um, as soon as the container starts, Kubernetes is going to be like, okay, your uh, container has started, so I'm going to send traffic to it. And actually what we want to do is we want to tell it, well, wait until the application is actually running. So in Kubernetes, there's this thing called health endpoints. And so you can add those to your application to say, uh, report, you know, if my connection with the database is up and running and everything, that um, now you can send traffic, not before that. So you can do that with uh, some extensions in, uh, in, uh, in Quarkus. So there's just a really simple small right health, which, and small right is an implementation of uh, MicroProfile. Um, and that's going to add those health endpoints automatically. And it knows that because I'm, I'm using a database that, uh, you know, look for database connections as well and make sure those are up and running as well. And then uh, just for fun, I'll add the small right open API uh, extension as well, which is going to add, you know, like uh, Swagger uh, and open API YAMLs or JSONs to my application as well. So it's going to uh, scan and find the endpoints that I've, that I've defined in my application, and we will see those as well. So right now, first, we'll go and look, and hopefully everything deployed correctly. So we'll hit refresh, and brrr, boom, yes. Our application is now up and running, using a database, using secrets, config maps, and all that in uh, Kubernetes. And we did that in you know, about uh, half an hour, right? So that's, uh, I think that's pretty cool with, uh, with Quarkus. And so just the last thing here before uh, we wrap up is in my local host, uh, because I added those health endpoints, I just want to show you um, in the dev UI again. Uh, I don't think we have time to, to deploy it again to Kubernetes, but we can see here that uh, we have small rye health, and we can see you know, in the health UI that my database connection is up and running. And uh, you know, if I deleted my database, uh, we would see that, you know, eventually it would say, well, it's not up and running, it's red, right? So, and that would be the same thing that happened on Kubernetes. So, it would, you know, uh, Kubernetes would see this application is not ready to receive requests because, you know, there's a health endpoint that's not, uh, that's not running. And then the same with uh, the open AI uh, extension that I just added. Just by adding that dependency, I get, you know, the, the, the JSON and the, or YAML for my open AI, and I even get a nice handy Swagger UI uh, to test my application, um, you know, so I can try it out again on my local machine and we can see that, well, let's pretend that it worked. <laughs> um, I think uh, it's probably trying to connect to the remote database. Anyway, that's it for, uh, for a very quick introduction, you know, going from zero to you know, let's say Hero, we did uh, pretty good with deploying an application and everything. So a uh, quick wrap up here. So if you want to get started with Quarkus, go to quarkus.io. Super cool. There's a lot of uh, cool other features that I haven't shown. So, uh, you know, definitely check it out. Um, if you want to get started with that OpenShift sandbox to deploy your Quarkus application once you build it, you just go to uh, developers.redhat.com slash developer sandbox. You can create a, a free account and then you get access to that. And um, maybe I'll just give you one second and see some people taking a uh, picture. All right. And then uh, tomorrow, book signing. So there's a modernizing enterprise Java. So, you know, modernize your legacy application uh, to kind of a Quarkus or Spring Boot application. So that's tomorrow at 12.10 with Natale and, uh, and Marcus who are right there. They're going to be signing books. And then uh, Alex is also uh, author of the Quarkus cookbook. He's also there signing a book. And uh, with that, the link to the slides, which, yeah, there weren't very many, but, you know, if you want them, there they are. And if you uh, want to connect with me, ask questions, 
Um, I also put uh, videos on YouTube, you know, with building Quarkus uh, applications and uh, building containers or whatever it is, or you want to follow me on Twitter. I try to be active and post some interesting stuff. So uh, that's it. So thank you.